For those of you who don't know me, my name is Josh. I'm the youth pastor here at City Hill Youth, um, at, or here at City Hill Church, I should say. Excuse me, this, this morning is not youth, but I just wanted to say from the bottom of my heart, and every, every time I get an opportunity to minister on a Sunday, I like to do this because genuinely, I would not be able to do it without your support, parents. I would not be able to do it without you guys, and I honor you, thank you. I know you're kind of just sending your kids in blindly on a Friday, this is what I look like, this is who I am. If you have any questions, we could come chat. If you have any concerns, let's do it. Um, but, but genuinely, I wanna say thank you. I wanna say thank you. I know we're not perfect. We're a bunch of messed up people that were once messed up, and now we're not messed up because we're filled with the Holy Spirit, amen? So we're here, we're loving Jesus, and um, if you're a parent and your kids don't go to youth, if they're between, if they're in the high school, college age, going into high school, maybe recently got out of college, or they're doing their, whatever, uh, intermediate year where they say they're gonna go back next year, and then they usually end up not going back the year after, we love to see them on Fridays. Uh, we love to see them every single Friday, so just wanna encourage you, bring them out. Um, and as well as, which is already mentioned in the video, we have our youth camp coming up. <laughs> camp Glory is right around the corner, August 23rd through the 26th, and, and there's so many testimonies every single year of God doing what only he can that weekend. It's a powerful time. Um, I'm not gonna reread the script that I, that I read for the video, but I mean, really, it is a powerful time. And why not have your kids, have your family be a part of an environment where we're far away from home, all the kids said amen, where we're together, we're in community together, where we have multiple services per day, we have so many opportunities to get to know people and sweat and have fun and get burned or get tan or whatever. And, and at the end of the day, there's encounter after encounter after encounter with the King of Kings in the Lord of Lords. Like, why not send your child there? Why not be there if you're a youth and you're not signed up? Hello, we're going soon, so don't, don't miss the bus, okay? Cool, amen? I'm excited for youth campus coming up. We're two weeks away. Prices are going up again here pretty soon. Um, don't wait for prices to go up. Sign up, get your family registered, get your kid registered. Um, it's gonna be an amazing time, amen? Amen, so... As we get into the word in, in preparation for this morning, as I, was, as I was preparing the sermon and just asking God, God, what do you wanna speak? Um, he really put it on my heart to share with you the heart kind of behind the sermon and what it looked like. I'll, I'll just be open and honest here for a few moments. Well, I'll be open and honest the rest of the sermon, but I'll share just for a few moments what it looked like. Um, a few weeks ago, I was sitting and, and I was just asking God, what do you wanna speak this Sunday morning? What do you wanna share? And he, in the stillness of that moment, in the stillness of that moment, he spoke these words, be open. He spoke the words, be open. And, and, I, and I, I don't know how to explain it to you, but in that moment, I understood this is what God wanted to share this morning. And he doesn't usually start the sermon prep for me by giving me a name of a sermon. Usually he gives me some other stuff first. But I went out in faith. And I'm excited to share what God put on my heart this morning. I'm excited to share what God's put on my heart this morning because every single person that is in the room, if you have given your life to Jesus, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Can I hear an amen? amen. Every single person has the capability, as 2 Peter says, to live a godly life. Every single person filled by the Holy Spirit does not live life on their own anymore. They don't live for themselves. They don't live selfishly, but they live selflessly now, or so they should or so they should. And, and what I wanna ask and, and what I wanna do is I wanna ask us what are we gonna do right now with the spirit that God has given us? What are we gonna do right now with our lives, with what God's been placing inside of us, with what God's been teaching us over the 10, 20, 30, 40 years of life, of Christianity? What are we gonna do right now, not later? It's so it's so. I don't wanna say easy, but tempting to just, just write it off for the future and say, you know what, one day God will speak, one day God will move, God put a dream in my heart, and, and one day it's gonna happen, but what about right now? What about right now? The Bible says now is the time of salvation. In other words, now is the time for healing, now is the time for God to move in us and through us. It's not later. He will move later, but the time is now. Jesus didn't die and get resurrected again on the third day so that you could do it on the third year. He did it so he could do it now. And, I, and hear me, I say this with love, and obviously it's, you know, it's easier said than done and, and all these things, but genuinely, I mean, he's empowered us to do this, amen? He has given us his precious Holy Spirit. So 
We're gonna get into the word. Before that, we're gonna pray. And I just encourage you, I challenge you even, to ask God to speak to you. It's easy and tempting, like I said before, maybe not always easy, to sit here and, and say, well, the word's for someone else, the word is for the person on my left or right, but what if the, person, what if the word's for me? What if the word's for you? Amen? Come on, let's close our eyes, bow our heads. Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We invite you, Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence here among us, God. God, we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, we thank you that you were good, you are good, and you will always be good. God, that you were a loving father, you are a loving father, and you will always be a loving father, Lord. God, we thank you for the for the word that you have placed on my heart, Jesus, and I ask God that it speaks to every single one of us, myself included. Lord, come and do what only you can this morning. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Can I start with an example and a little, little story, and then I'm gonna build off of it? Is that okay? So like, like I said, uh, I am a youth pastor, so I spend a lot of time with young people, and forgive me for my youthful examples. I'm, I've tried to like tailor them to the families more so, but there's still gonna be a few youthful examples. So with that being said, who has heard of or ever played the game Mafia? I think this applies to a lot of us. Praise be to God. I'm gonna real quick summarize it. If you've never played or maybe you, I don't know, maybe you've never played or you've been under a rock or something or you never got the opportunity to play this beautiful, amazing game called Mafia that we all love and hold and cherish uh, so closely to us. Real quick, let me just paint the setting for you. Typically, it's a group of about 15 people, maybe friends, not friends, people you know, people you don't know, or more. You get together, usually it's at a birthday, at the end of something, or at a bonfire, we're like, what do we wanna do? Well, let's play Mafia, okay. What is the game Mafia? It's a game where we're all together, and there's different identities that are handed out. So there's the, some obvious ones, civilians, there's sheriff, there's doctor, depending on how you play, there's a hobo that's handed out. Um, and of course, there's the dreaded mafia, right? And the goal is, I promise you, it's, a, it's like an encouraging and edifying game, but the goal is for these three, four, five mafia to kill everyone in the group, metaphorically, not actually physically. And I apologize for being graphic, but that, that's just the goal. And the goal of everybody else, the sheriff, it's to catch the mafia, right? The doctor, it's to save whoever the mafia might try to off, off with their head. Um, and the civilians, it's their job in addition to everybody else to decide and pick and essentially hold a court of law, saying, okay, you know what, Danny's the mafia or Ruben's the mafia. All right, Danny, why are you not the mafia? Ruben, why are you not the mafia? We vote and then one of them gets selected and that's how we go. And the end game, the mafia, obviously, they wanna be the last ones alive. Everybody else, they wanna stay alive. So they wanna win, right? And in this game, me personally, I'm going somewhere with this, I promise, me personally, the climax of the game is when there's a little bucket being passed around with little pieces of papers with something written on them called identity. And the climax for me is that moment because it's at this moment that I know I'm either gonna be a mafia, a sheriff, doctor, whatever else, or I'm gonna be the dreaded civilian that gets to do nothing the entire game except for get abused and probably die in the game. And that's what I don't want. I, I can't stand being a civilian. I feel like I'm just doing nothing and I might as well clock out for the rest of the game. But this is the climax for me personally. And I wanna relate this back to our lives because every single one of us, whether, hopefully you're not a mafia, but whether you're a sheriff, a doctor, or whatever else, I mean, you get what I'm saying, not actually a sheriff or a doctor, but whatever else, whatever season you might be in your life, there's a certain moment in every one of our lives where it feels as though we're doing nothing. There's a certain moment in every single one of our lives where it feels as though, and maybe it actually is and doesn't even just feel this way, that there's no point for us to even really do anything. Like we're just kind of on autopilot, life is running us instead of us running life, and, and we're, we just kind of exist. Does, that, does anyone relate to that? Have you ever been there? I've certainly been there, where you just kind of exist. And as a believer, it's tempting to sit back and to wait until we have more time, or it's tempting to sit back and wait until the dream God put on our heart just magically happens, right? But here's the deal, that it's not really how it works. Like I said, the Holy Spirit's been given to all of us that have received Jesus as our Lord and Savior, amen? So it's not right for us as believers to be sitting and waiting for 
a move of God to come like a lightning bolt and strike us, and then the next day we're on fire for the Lord, when day one we were doing nothing. That's not how it works. Does that make sense? It's a gradual progression. And this game, I'm not gonna talk about it too much more, but I will, I will jump into scripture right now. This game, it reminds me of a character in scripture. His name is David, King David. And really the life that he lived before he became a king, he wasn't all that known. So before, we know David as the man that killed Goliath, you know, the story of David and Goliath. We know him as the one that wrote many of the Psalms in the book of Psalms. The Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. We know him for some of his moral failures, unfortunately. We also know him for the selfless moments that he lived when he was being persecuted by his family and, and so on. There's so many things we could say about David. He's a really famous man in scripture, right? But David, like all of us, at one point in our lives was kind of a nobody. David, at one point in his life, he, well, he was a shepherd. He was a shepherd, he was the son of Jesse. And I'd like us to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16, it'll be on the screen. We're gonna read a few verses, verses four through seven, and then we'll continue. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse four, this is what it says. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. And when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong, they asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, so purify yourselves and come with me to sacrifice. And then Samuel, he performed the purification rite for Jesse, for his sons, and he invited them to this sacrifice also. And when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab, who was the oldest son, and he thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed one. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not judge by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord, he looks at the heart. Say heart. So some context here. In this time, Israel, what was going on is they were asking God to give them a king. So they were asking Samuel, hey Samuel, we really want a king because all the other nations of the world, they have a king, but we have nobody to rule over us. When in reality, God wanted to be their king, is what the scriptures say. But God, nevertheless, as a gentleman, he said, okay, you know what? This is not good for you, but this is what you want. You already made up your mind. I'm gonna give you a king. So he gave them King Saul. Say Saul. He gave them King Saul. Now, King Saul, initially, the spirit of God was upon him, but Saul, he began really quickly, honestly, in a few chapters, he began to disobey. He began to forsake the commandments of God. He began to do things that maybe in the moment they seemed like just minor steps away, minor alterations, but in reality, it was disobedience to God. So Samuel, he meets God, and God speaks to him, and he actually says this, which is really sad. He says, I'm sorry that I ever even made Saul king. He says, I'm sorry, God, I mean, imagine that being said about you. Hopefully never, none of us in Jesus' mighty name. But he said, I am sorry that I ever even made him king. And then he says, go into the house of Jesse, and there I will anoint a new king. So that's where we're at right now. Does that make sense? We all following? Okay. Verse 10, this is what it says as we continue the story. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel, but Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Are there any other sons that you might have? And then Jesse said, there is still the youngest, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. Send him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down and eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark, he was handsome, with beautiful eyes, amen. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took a flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. And then Samuel returned to Ramah. So here we see this is the beginning of David's life before we know him for all the things he's known for. He was actually kind of a nobody. Similar, if we go back to the game, he was kind of a civilian, kind of just there. I like to call him, he was the eighth son, even though there were seven, because somehow his dad forgot him. When a prophet came through, he brought up all his sons, but he didn't bring up David. He's forgotten. He was spat on, maybe not physically, but he was, he was also a shepherd. He kept an eye on the sheep, and in biblical times, shepherds, they were the bottom rung of society. I don't know if you knew that. I wasn't fully aware of that, but culturally, they had a reputation of being scoundrels. They were always written off. 
They were known as unclean. Some even called them sinners. Shepherds being a class of despised people. That's King David. King David, he started as being a despised person called a sinner, called unclean. But God, God didn't agree with that. God didn't agree with that. He said, I judge by what's in the heart. So obviously God, he sees something in David's heart that we don't see. But based on David's occupation, we know that others didn't exactly look at him and revere him. We know that others didn't exactly look at him as the most relevant man in the, in the, in the country or anything like that. He was just a shepherd. He was just watching the sheep. And based on the cards that life dealt him, so to say, David easily, and maybe some would even say justifiably so, could have taken a position of offense. I'm just a shepherd boy. David easily, he could have taken the position and actually taken the position of being nobody. Actually walked in that, you know what, I'm just here, I'm just gonna coast by life, I'm just gonna watch the sheep, I'm just gonna kind of hang out with them and my life's not important, so whatever. David, he could have blamed God he could have got hurt and bitter toward the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords based on the circumstances that he was dealt with. But what we know now, and the, Israel, uh, the country of Israel didn't know then, is this was actually their next king. Are you with me? This was actually their next king. And David, he could have sat at home, he could have refused to watch his father's sheep because, well, now I'm anointed as king. He could have said, no, I'm, I'm good. I don't have to do this anymore. I've now been anointed as king. You never looked at me with honor. Uh, now you have to honor me because I'm gonna be the next king. He could have walked in pride in the name of waiting on the Lord by despising the season he was currently in instead of investing in his next season. But we see that he didn't. David, he was a man of integrity. Scripture says that afterward he came back to his father. He came back to watch the sheep, the same father that forgot him, mind you. And his heart was with the Lord. The Lord picked him due to his heart. Later we see in Scripture, David was called a man after God's own heart. And like I said before, that love that he had for God, it didn't just come like a lightning bolt out of nowhere. It obviously came over time. If God saw that the heart that David had for him this early on when all we knew him as was a shepherd... Can you imagine the conversations that David was having with the Lord in private? Can you just imagine that with me? David being alone, being despised, being forgotten, there's still a union and a relationship that he has with God because he understands that this is God and this is God Almighty. David not taking offense, maybe he was hurt a little bit, we don't know for sure, but not taking offense to the point where he decided to put life in neutral and see where it took him, he stayed in drive. He stayed in drive. And as adults, as, as busy young people, as parents, as businessmen, as, as full-time mothers, whatever else, whoever else is in the room, we can easily have a life that's flying on autopilot, despising what God wants to do in us and through us right now today in hopes that maybe someday he will do something. Can I tell you something? I really believe, from what I see here in Scripture, God is watching what we do today. God is watching what we do today, August, today's August 11th, right? All the accountants in the room, August 11th, thank you. Today's August 11th. God actually cares about what we do on August 11th. And we might be looking at 2027. We might be looking at our five-year business plan, and, and all these things are great. Don't get me wrong. It's good to, I mean, the Scriptures even talk about if you don't count the cost, how foolish of a builder are you? And that's, and that's true. That, there's truth in that. It's important to look ahead, but we can't look so far ahead that we despise what God is doing right now. Or should I say what God wants to do through us right now? Does that make sense? So God wants us to step back and be open to us for what he has in store right now. Say now. And when we look at David, this is my, this is my first point if you're taking notes. David was open to what God had for him now. He was open for that, and what did God have for him now, or can I even say this, what does God have for you now that you cannot disprove, that you, no matter how many, no matter what you tell me, you can't tell me that this is a lie. God has a relationship with him in store for you right now. 
That's what God has for us right now, an intimate friendship, communion with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, because otherwise he wouldn't have sent his son to die for us. Otherwise he wouldn't have given us the Holy Spirit. So you cannot tell me that a relationship with God is too far-fetched. A relationship with God is for today. A relationship with God is for right now, I would even say. It's for during worship. It's for during the sermon. It's for when we pray for food. It's for when we're washing our cars. It's for when we're in the workplace. The Bible calls us a temple of the Holy Spirit. Can you say temple? Say temple. A temple of the Holy Spirit. A temple in the Old Testament, and, and I've, been, I've shared this with a few of you, but it's really been on my mind lately. A temple, it's the meeting place between heaven and earth. So if we are called the temple of the Holy Spirit, we are the meeting place between heaven and earth. It means we're in two places at one time. We are both in heaven and on earth. What does that look like? That's too spiritual. That's, I don't understand. Can I please just break it down simply? This is what it looks like. I work an office job. I work, let's call it a nine to five. It's a seven to four, but let's call it a nine to five, right? I work a nine to five job. That means I'm on earth. Does that make sense? I don't fly to Neptune or something to go work my job. I'm here physically on earth. But I also have the Holy Spirit in me, which means I am bringing heaven to my workplace. One, one pastor said it this way, to be a disciple of Jesus, it's not just about discipline, it's not just about, and it is about these things, hear me right, but it's not only about picking up your cross, it's about being in two places at one time. It's being both in heaven and on earth because we are called to bring heaven down to earth. Does that make sense? David, he continued to remain in God's presence. Like I already said, the scriptures called him a man after God's own heart. He was also a shepherd. So you're telling me you could be a man after God's heart or a woman after God's heart but still and be a doctor at the same time? Yes. You can be a sheriff and still be a man after God's own heart? Yes. You could wash your car and still commune with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Absolutely. My dad who's not here, haha, he's not here. My dad who's not here, he's had some of the craziest revelations in washing his car. He's had some of the most pivotal moments. He shared this with me, and I don't say this to boast or anything, and he's not here, so. He's had some of the most pivotal moments of his life where God has spoken to him to actually start a ministry from the ground up while he's washing his car. While he's washing his car. He's not washing his car for hours and hours. The point is, he's living on earth, but he has heaven with him because the presence of God is always in us and working through us. Amen? Amen. 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 And here's the deal. David, like I said already, I'm not trying to beat, beat the horse dead, but David, he could have lived in this position of taking on insignificance. You know, I'm just a shepherd. It's fine. I'm just a shepherd. I don't really have to do anything. There's other people that are the hands and feet of Jesus. He could have taken this on, but he understood that God was with him. He understood that God was with him. And God has a significant plan for every single one of us. Even if right now you're in a place of insignificance or feeling insignificant, can I tell you that God has a significant plan for you? He's calling us from insignificance to significance. I know that's a lot of if against. But basically, what I mean by all this is no matter what is going on right now, he wants to meet us in that. And even if it feels as though we're doing boring, mundane stuff, you know what? I'd rather do boring, mundane stuff with him than alone. That's what it is, okay? Jeremiah 29, 11, This is how I know he has plans for you. It says this. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Come on. That's a good promise. It's one of the most famous scriptures, and it's a promise for you. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. So notice it's for a future, but it's also a hope for today, Okay? And as believers, like I said, we're called to bring heaven down to earth. So the call here in this and, and what we see with David, with King David, King David, he was open to what God had for him right now. And what God has for us right now is a relationship with him. Amen? And in a relationship with him, we're called to be in two places at once. We're called to be with him and serving the world. We're called to be in his presence, 
while we're doing the things that we do here on earth and allow God to speak through us, to us, in our situations and circumstances and occupations now. He's faithful to speak, amen? The next thing we see in David, not only was he open to what God had in store for him, but he was open to what God wanted to do in him. So in store for him was kind of more of a, call it a, a mediation between internal and external. But there was also some moments in David's life where God began to prune his character. There was moments in David's life where God began to speak to the areas of his weakness, where God began to challenge him and put trials and tribulations into his life. Can I read some more scripture? Come on, who loves the word of God? The word of God is better than my commentary. So here we go. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34. 17, 34. This is what it says, just the next chapter. David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when the lion or a bear came, he took the lamb out of the flock. And I went out after the, the, the lion or the bear and I struck it. And I delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine, it's talking about Goliath, will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. So David, we see not only was his past kind of troublesome, but after he was anointed to be king, he went through some tribulations. Say tribulation. Say trial. Maybe it's a little easier. He went through some stuff after that. David, he was tested by fire. And I'm sure he wasn't overjoyed to see lions and bears coming after him and his flock. I'm not going to spend too much time here. I don't know what lions and bears that you have going after you and your flock. But I know that God will help you through it. And I know that God will bring us strength to fight through those tribulations. And, and in fighting through those tribulations, David actually began to take on characteristics of what Jesus would do for us. He, this, is what, this is what happened. David, he stayed faithful, being a shepherd, even though he was called a king. Amen? And what ended up happening later on, as a lion or a bear would go after the one sheep, he would go and fight for that one sheep. Jesus, who left the 99 and went after the one sheep, he began to fight for that one sheep. And that one sheep is you, that one sheep was me. So David, he really quickly, we see initially he had this relationship with the Lord, this, be this pure relationship with the Lord, but then he actually began to take on the characteristics of what God had in store for him. He began to step out and do uncomfortable things because that's what God demanded. He began to live, well, let's just bring it to today's day and age, he, his life began to change. He began to live in purity. He began to fight for his family. He began to fight for the sheep that were being attacked. And parents, I'm a new parent, but what I know is we're called to fight for the sheep that God has entrusted us with. And in, in doing so, two things happen. Number one, the sheep that God has given us are protected, amen? Say praise God. But in number two, our character is developed because we're actually going out and doing the things that are countercultural in this earth. And our character begins to change and look like him. And it actually puts a demand in us because we're constantly fighting. We're constantly fighting. We're fighting for the sheep that don't know any better. That's what we're doing. And, we're, and here's the reality. We're all called to do that, not just the pastors. We are all shepherds of our own flock, whatever it may look like. Mark chapter two, verse 17. If we could put it on the screen. This is what it says. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, for, but for those that know they are sinners. Jesus, he makes the comparison here of sinners to sick people. And those that are righteous to be those that are not sick. Does that make sense? And Jesus, he's known as, as the great physician. He's the one that heals, but he's also the one that heals our heart. And by healing the heart, what do I mean by that? I, I do mean in the, in the physical ways where there's emotional trauma that he's healing, and, and he does all that, amen? But I also mean that he changes the nature of our being. We are shaped into his image, as the great doctor, amen? Yes. 
And he's such a good doctor that he wasn't sick. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't really want a doctor that's sick with whooping cough to treat me for whooping cough. Not a good idea. So with the doctor that does not have whooping cough, well, his goal is when he's operating on me, or maybe not fully operating, but prescribing medicine and doing these things, is, hey, I want you to be healthy like me. And Jesus, when he operates on us, it's not just because he wants to screw around with us or he wants to take away what we think is good. He wants to help us. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it's a lion. Sometimes it's a bear. But ultimately, it makes us look more like him. Amen? So David, he allowed God to change what he looked like, and, and us, we're, we're called to change what we look like through the power of God as well. And Artem, you can actually make your way on stage onto the keys. The last thing that I want to pull from this story of David pre-fame is David, he was open He was open to being used for what God wanted him to be used for. He was open to what God wanted to do through, through him. He was open to being a king. He was also open to being a shepherd. He probably would have been open to being a milkman. Maybe open to being a stay-at-home whatever. I think David would have been open to any of those things if that's what God had in store for him. Can I tell you what God has in store for us? Again, we're called the temple of the Holy Spirit. God brings the Spirit down into us to do what? God wants to change the world through us. God wants to change the world through us. If I go back to my my silly mafia example. As much as I don't like being a civilian in the game of mafia, here's the thing I know. Without civilians in the game of mafia, there's no winning. I'll say it again. Without civilians in the game of mafia, there is no winning. Without the insignificant role of a civilian that can't really do much, there's a lot of them, but they, you know, they're not the ones that open their eyes when everyone else has their eyes closed. They're not the ones that maybe drive the game. In this world, in this life, it's the body of Christ that is called to carry out the will of what God has in store. It's the body of Christ, let's just, let's just call it the people that feel as though they have no part to play have the biggest part to play. I think the role, I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but the role of the fivefold ministry, prophets, pastors, evangelists, apostles, teachers, and so on. I think those are the ones that oftentimes are, and in some ways rightfully so, but those are the ones that are oftentimes, well, you know what, you take care of it. Pastor Paul, I know you're not here today, but you know, you take care of it. You're the pastor, it's kind of what you're supposed to do. Did you know that the role of a pastor is to edify you? The role of a pastor is to edify the one that is not the pastor? The role of a pastor is to activate and to send out the one that is a civilian, the one that feels as though there's nothing for him or her to do. In other words, I'm just gonna speak as if I'm at youth here for a moment. My job for the youth is not to preach great sermons. My job for the youth is to activate you to spend time with the Lord. It's to activate you to look like the Lord and it's to activate you to walk like Jesus did. Because I will not save the world. Jesus died to save the world and he gave us his Holy Spirit to go and walk out what he has called us to do. Even if we had every pastor and every evangelist and every teacher and, and whatever else, every prophet, serve 200% of the time and, and give 200% effort and do all these things, that would not nearly be enough because the Bible says he's coming for a pure and spotless bride, not a pure and spotless pastor, not a pure and spotless evangelist, although that is a part of obviously the bride of Christ, but he's calling all of us to rise up and to go. He's calling all of us to be open, to be open to what God has in store.
And God, he changed the world through David. He did. He changed the world through David. This is what scripture says in Jeremiah 33. For this is what the Lord says. David will have a descendant sitting on the throne of Israel forever. It is through David's lineage that Jesus himself came. Jesus, the son of David. It's through David that all this came to pass. And the goal of my message this morning, it's not... It's not to say, go be a king, go be like King David. It's not to say, go be a shepherd. It's to say, allow God to move through you right now, where you are right now. I'm not calling you to full-time ministry. I'm not calling you to Africa. Maybe some of you will. I'm not calling you to go to preach to the penguins in Antarctica. I'm not calling you to, to leave everything behind and, and like physically and go and move out. You know, some of us actually have to stay here and carry out the work of God here right now. Federal Way is not pretty. I love this city. I feel like God's put a special love for this city in my heart. But it's not very pretty. God's calling us to go out. And I'm not just saying to go out and to preach. And I'm not just saying to go out into the world. But I'm saying to go out into his presence. Because it's in his presence where we get equipped. It's in his presence where we find purpose. It's in his presence where we stop looking like the dirty, ugly shepherd and we begin to look like a son and a daughter of God. It's in his presence where our lives begin to get transformed. It's in his presence. It's in his presence. And as I'm closing here, I just... I've been feeling this for a few weeks now. Can you imagine what this church would look like if we were all open to a relationship with Jesus? I'm not saying if we're all open to being Christian. Unfortunately, there's a difference between being a Christian and being a disciple. A disciple is one that lives with him only. A disciple is one that leaves everything behind, goes after him every day, brings heaven down to earth. A disciple is one that follows Jesus. A disciple is one that actually walks with Jesus. That he's the first thought in the morning, he's the last thought in the evening. Could you imagine with me what our church would look like if we were a room full of believers that were disciples and apprentices to Jesus? In the electrical field, if, if you do it legally, of course, if you're an apprentice, it means you have to be with your journeyman. There's some different rules to it, but it means for the most part, if your journeyman's not there, you can't be there. If the guy that's above you is at a different job site, that's where you gotta go because you're not legally allowed to be alone. And can I tell you that as believers, I would even say we are not legally allowed to be away from Jesus because he is the great. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the way. He's the one. And to forfeit that, to step away from him, is honestly to step away from being a Christian. Because it's with him that we find our purpose. Amen? Could you imagine what this church would look like? And hear me, I'm saying this with love, but, but if we if we took the trials that God has been given us and if we took the things that we have been learning and we applied them and we began to serve selflessly and we began to raise our families selflessly, we began to love selflessly. Mark, he preached a, a word on the many things that could disunify us here in this world, but the one thing that can always and will always unify us and that is Jesus. Can we imagine a church that decides to forfeit preferences for the name of Jesus? A church that decides to just lay everything down because that's what he did? A church that was open to doing his work? A church that said yes because that's what Jesus did? He took the cross on himself. He said yes when no one else would. What would this church look like? Well, this church would look like Jesus. This church would look like Jesus because 
It's Jesus, the same Jesus that he forfeited his upbringing to go spend time with the Lord. It's Jesus that climbed mountains to talk with the Father. It's Jesus that was filled with the Holy Spirit and grew into the image of God. It's Jesus that he carried out the ultimate cost, the ultimate sacrifice and hanging on a tree for you and I. For what? For us to live like him. For us to live like him. What would our homes look like? What would this church look like? What would our relationship with our kids look like? What would our relationship with our neighbors look like? It would look a whole lot like Jesus. And that's the message this morning. It's to be open to what Jesus has in store now because he has something in store for every single one of us. If we could all stand to our... Hey, thank you for watching City Hill Church YouTube. Subscribe so you never miss when we go live or post new content. Make sure to leave a comment about what spoke to you, where you're watching from, and how can we pray for you. And if you would like to support the ministry, you can give right on our website at cityhillchurch.org and help us keep reaching people for Jesus. Thank you and be blessed.